welcome to all of you uh, in this gaming session, uh, how uh, Indian gaming is changing the game. So I also welcome all my panelists. Uh, uh, I want to begin with, uh, you know, uh, want to understand uh, the state of Indian gaming landscape in India first from all of you, like what's the current state like? Or you, uh, you guys, if you can, you know, introduce yourself, a brief intro first, uh, what you guys Uh, hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Keithi Singh, I'm co-founder at Hitwicket. Hitwicket is India's highest rated cricket game on Play Store and App Store. We have over 5 million users across 104 countries. And our vision is to build uh, the best cricket game out there that can engage the billion cricket fans globally. Hi everyone, I'm Parth. I'm the co-founder at Stan. Uh, it's been 7 years odd for me in the gaming industry. Uh, looked at all the uh, different genres, starting from real money gaming, hyper casual, and now building something really uh, interesting into communities of gaming. So Stan is about the gamers community platform. We believe that whatever communities existed today are not doing decent or a good job at it. So we kind of took that uh, mission and uh, it's a lot of esports like little games like PUBG, Free Fire, Call of Duty. So you find our app on the Play Store. We're trending on number three since the last five months and got like close to five million gamers now. Um, and uh, people come to play, meet, make friends uh, and uh, play with the creators and YouTubers, which they really admire. Hi everyone, a very good afternoon. I am Trupti and uh, I'm also uh, from Reliance Geo, it's like a startup, but uh, yeah, and I manage the gaming segment of uh, Geo, which is Geo Games, and mainly focusing on the user engagement and uh, marketing. And yes, we do focus on the overall uh, gaming ecosystem. Uh, start, we are a publishing platform, and we are into different segments like esports and uh, streaming as well. So as we go along, we'll talk a lot more about it. Right. So we also have with us Samir. Uh, Samir, welcome uh, to our summit. Can you hear us? Some problem with the... We can't hear you. Okay. Samir, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Welcome, Samir. Hi, thanks for having me there. I felt like a weird guy talking, looking behind people's heads while they talk. Uh, so I don't see three panelists, can't see any of the audience, but uh, thanks for having me here and for accommodating the fact that I'm not there in person. Okay. I am Samit, I lead the gaming sales for Cloud and APAC okay. for Google. Thanks for the introduction, guys. Uh, uh, I was uh, I was asking you know I want to if you guys can throw the light on the current uh, gaming landscape uh, in the current state of gaming in India you know you can talk about it first Samir can you uh, start? Can sure. You talk? Yeah. I mean estimates are broad but you know anywhere between three to four billion out of that roughly one point eight to two odd billion is referred to as RMG um, you know in app purchases dominated by probably two games roughly in the range of six hundred to eight hundred million dollars. And the balance 300 to 400 mil is looked at as the advertising revenue that happens from games. So that's some of the broad range right now. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, what we have observed is uh, there are around, uh, totally around 800 million who are uh, telecom users, I can say, out of which uh, almost 80% of them are on internet. And almost around 450 million uh, users are there who play on a you know regular basis. The total number of gamers in the country, and out of which almost 100 million almost play on a daily basis. It ranges from casual gaming till uh, you know uh, esports uh, professional level gaming as well. And yes, of course, I think. Uh, a lot of technologies are adapting uh, much more in the gaming segment than gamification and further tools as such. Yeah, I think um, I've been looking at this space from almost like five, six years now. Uh, 
a lot has changed um, for the good. Obviously, thanks to Mr. COVID, we saw those golden years for our industry. And it's not been bad after that. It's actually been pretty good in the sense that uh, there have been a lot of mature gamers uh, who were very casual before. And uh, I think the good part is the access to games is become pretty uh, free and easy. Like free to play games existed and the content has been pretty interesting. Uh, obviously everybody talks about the games like Ludo, PUBG, Free Fire and all these have, you know, the table toppers, right? So, um, and that have led to be uh, a strong drivers and obviously we see mo mobile is something which is the dominating uh, piece of it. I believe what, I think 80% of the uh, gaming audience would be playing on phone right now. And uh, like Samir mentioned that close to 500 million gamers, I think the interesting piece which we are seeing today is 25% uh, of these are paying, right? Uh, which was close to like 10, 12% before. And it's growing like every year with like 20% on. Uh, so if you do the math, it's close to what 120, 140 million gamers who are paying in the games. And uh, these could be spread across all those genres and categories which Samir was telling, like real money gaming and in-app purchases. Uh, interestingly, what we have started seeing in Stan, where we have a community of gamers, uh, is people kind of are building trust faster uh, with, the, with the product and spending more uh, and repeat purchases is something which is coming up. So it's a golden era for the Indian gaming market. What are your views Indian gaming? Okay. Uh, yeah, so as everybody has rightly said, gaming has uh, come of age. And I think uh, the interesting bit is not just on the consumer side, but on the ecosystem, like I remember uh, in 2015 when I was graduating from ISB, nobody thought gaming was a mainstream industry. People would think about building a career in edtech and fintech and health tech and x tech. But uh, gaming, even though it was generating billions of dollars globally, was picking up in India, it wasn't getting the limelight that it should have gotten. So that way, I think it's very good to see that, you know, today young grads, engineers, MBAs, they're thinking about building a career in India. India is a consumption market, but we need creators as well. People who are making the PUBG for India, right? Games which can make uh, Indians spend on in-app purchases. So that's where I feel that a big uh, leap has happened where Indians are getting inspired to build games not just for the Indian audience, but for the global audience as well. All right, but uh, if we talk about the gamers, are you seeing the change in the demographic uh, of the gamers, means the profile and everything? I mean, we just heard that uh, there, there's what, close to 30% female, 40% female gamers now, uh, what, uh, you know, uh, a fellow panelist is talking about. So I think, uh, and thanks to the content around like Candy Crush and all, which has led to a lot lot of spread and uh, I think tier 2, tier 3, tier 4, that has kept on evolving in the last couple of years, right? And that's all because of I think the smartphones penetration which has happened. Like you can play a decent game on a smartphone which costs you like 4,000, 5,000 bucks. So uh, even on our platform we see close to like 35% tier 1 but and rest of it is like the Bharat, right? Uh, uh, which is kind of loving this. Um, and I think uh, socializing is helping uh, in gaming uh, and I think we are in the positive space and why it's growing so rapidly is because Indian population is generally very young, right? So I think uh, 70 to 30 years of age is where the maximum bracket of uh, like you'll see the gamers uh, there. So there's no drastic change there but like I said pen penetration in the tier 2, tier 3 has kind of uh, grown very rapidly. Samir, I uh, would like to know, you agree with the part or you use uh, a different, uh, what's your assessment? My assessment of sort of the demographics of our audiences? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, broadly, pretty much if you look at it as a cross-section, uh, there's no new insight I can bring to what part said, so I'll refrain okay. from comment. <laughs> okay. Oh. And what do you have to say on, you know, gaming? Uh, is being now viewed as an you know entertainment uh, on that what, what are you like? uh, so 
I think broadly you can see this as a if you see this as how games have evolved. Initially, they would be just downloadable software that you end up paying for as entertainment. Soon enough, it ended up having the second sort of phase, which was the ability to always be live services. So these were games that were not just sort of static pieces of object, but they really ended up having, like with regular software, updates being put out to them to keep users engaged. And it kind of became what you would call games as a service. Soon enough, it's kind of become games as a franchise where your core lore and story and characters are what we expand into transmedia. You're seeing this happening with, you know, AAA titles, and especially single player titles now, like Last of Us and it winning Emmys and League of Legends expanding into, you know, say, Arcane and Netflix. And you're seeing more and more of that happen now as game pipelines begin to enter film and production. And finally, where we are today is, you know, games as platforms, which is really the idea of games becoming 3D social worlds as envisioned originally by the likes of Roblox and now Fortnite, Minecraft, and soon enough GTA. So that's sort of the pinnacle of what games will end up looking like. And you're already seeing that being routed out now about a year and a half ago once Fortnite launched UEFN. And most, it's very really hard to get there because these need to be really thriving economies, you need to build tool sets that enable UGC. Uh, so that's sort of, I guess, the, the expression of how uh, players become viewers and some viewers end up becoming developers. So that's, you know, in terms of what I feel it will continue to evolve to as tools that to make these games become democratized. I think Google's released a recent paper on called Genie. Uh, that's a really interesting paper about how these foundational world models are creating deeply interactive worlds. So I guess, you know, over the next five years, how games get designed and developed will also fundamentally change. Kirti would like to know from you, do you think games have evolved as a mainstream entertainment now? Or do you differ? No, I, I mean, games have always been for entertainment. And uh, obviously, uh, how games are interesting is because it gives the ability of the gamer to engage with the game to the depth that he wants to. So you can just play a casual board game and you know, it can just de-stress you for 10 minutes and that's your dose of entertainment. Somebody can play COD or you know, another FPS game and immerse himself for an hour, an hour and a half and that is entertainment for him. Somebody can take gaming to another level, be an esports player and uh, represent his nation. So I think that way uh, gaming does very well in the fact that you know it allows somebody from five minutes entertainment to actually maybe two or three hours of uh, seriousness, uh, you know even lending itself to building a career. So that way I would say that uh, gaming has evolved and it has given people the ability to do however they want to engage with it. Aren't you? Yeah, I think it has always been fun, like what Kirti said, and uh, um, I think there are multiple factors which led to uh, like crazy growth, and that's how it became the most obvious choice for entertainment. Uh, again, like we just heard that gaming revenue even crossed OTT's revenue in the last one year, right? That is that that's in itself an example that people want to spend where they're really like enjoying and uh, like uh, there have been diverse content so everybody is kind of picking what they like so that has led to that entertainment uh, in, in, in its own sense and obviously uh, these days the Gen Z's millennials are not stepping out and playing cricket and football that much to be honest what it was in my days like when I was a kid uh, they are hanging out more on uh, like platforms where they can find peers to play together like Stan and you know Discord and they want to just make friends on those uh, different avenues. So uh, it has become kind of an obvious choice for somebody that uh, the conversations are around gaming and because I think it has been uh, uh, you know caused that there is a lot of gamification across apps, there is so much content around it and what Samir mentioned around uh, people even viewing gaming content like live streaming for that matter, right? Uh, it was never a big industry for India. And now 
uh, like you could find five people sitting in a room and watching uh, game streams, right? Either on YouTube or Twitch, right? So all these different uh, ways where people are consuming gaming content is something which has led to kind of making it the obvious choice of entertainment. Yeah, so my views on the entertainment aspect, if we go to look at it uh, traditionally, what has been a source of entertainment to the Indian audience has been television, radio, and nowadays it's OTT apps. And uh, <clears throat> further, if I again further go divide it among the number of uh, people, or let's talk about economics of the same. Uh, around 80 million of them are paying users for different OTT apps in the country according to certain reports of few experts. Uh, similarly, around 92, again 110 million are the paying users for gaming. So economy wise, yes, I think it is a kind of a leading entertainment sector. And when it comes to engaging in a different aspect of it, I think people are adopting mostly to uh, becoming creators because uh, that is one thing they can uh, gaming content has been streamed and they're making a lot of money out of it i think recently one of the gamers got uh, uh, facilitated by the rpm as well for being one of the top uh, gaming creator and creators economy is a huge media chunk right now even on youtube after music gaming is the most watched uh, entertainment uh, segment in YouTube as well. So I can very clearly say that uh, it has evolved a long way just from last year to this year and it will further go ahead uh, when it coming in coming years. I can say that. I was coming to that uh, we were seeing uh, you know we we're seeing a lot of uh, rise in uh, gaming influences like you true, true, you know, the creator true. economy. So uh, Samir uh, what's your take on you know the rise uh, in gaming influencers? these days? I mean, uh, like my panelists suggested, it, was, it is the second largest category on uh, on platforms like YouTube after music. It tends to be a great way to, games are inherently social, so the ability to build conversations inside of these 3D worlds leads to a lot of easy way to make content on video. So, you are also seeing the other happen where influencers are now using the large communities that they have built on platforms like Twitch and YouTube to launch game studios and reduce their user acquisition costs. Uh, it will continue to be the dominant form of creating content, not just in terms of, you know, you've got folks who actually start their careers, understanding when you're building games, when you're building videos, for example, inside of games like Roblox or Fortnite, it allows you to get accustomed to the tools in order to create these videos. By and that, I don't mean the video creation tools. What I, that I mean the machinima related tools that you use, such as these game engines, whether it's Roblox Studio or whether it's Unreal Engine. And that kind of lets you not just create videos, but gives you the knowledge base to eventually end up making games themselves. So I think you know both of these are inherently going to be complementary. Uh, communities. So the video community currently is really large, but what you're seeing is after a while when people build these large audiences on YouTube, uh, they actually pick up a lot of the skill sets to understand what makes for good games, especially on platforms like Roblox and Fortnite and others, and end up you know finding ways to dabble in that by creating instead of videos, games, and using the audience they made on videos to drive them towards those worlds that they've created. Something the yeah, I think the biggest reason to start Stan was this. Like Stan is a fusion of creator economy and gaming because we started noticing a very interesting uh, thing that across YouTube, uh, people's uh, like live watching started spiking when they started playing games. Like folks like Tanmay Bhatt, Samir Rana, like people know them probably as comedians, but a lot of their mass audience came Tanmay was playing PUBG, Samir was playing chess. So we started noticing that because I, in my previous experiences, were working very closely with these YouTubers, right? Uh, so, but we started seeing that uh, if we could create an avenue where these guys can make money, they can monetize their fan base, that would be game changer. And uh, in, in terms of YouTube, it's predominantly ad revenues, which we are seeing. Um, and the good thing about creator is, 
he actually is known for let's say you know two things majorly one he is good at playing the game like you go to watch his content because of the mechanics of the game like he really teaches you tips and tricks ki how to win the game or he is very funny playing the game which is like the folks like Karim Nadi and all right so these two things have led to mass distribution as well uh, so any new game today starts influencer marketing so a lot of dollars kind of shifted from performance marketing from the you know meta and everything to influencer led approach this is something which actually uplifted the rmg industry in india like i was running an rmg platform before stand and i could see like 70% of my marketing spends were going to influencers so we felt that there's a big need that we could create a platform where the influencers who are probably you know into gaming for fun for mechanics of it they can build their community as well as monetize through the users as well like they could give exclusive content they could uh, you know get people to pay to play with them right so the uniqueness of a creator economy and gaming fusion is something which is going to you know keep on increasing from now and we'll see a lot of more dollars coming to influencer marketing for gaming industry So yeah, I mean, uh, everybody has rightly pointed it out and uh, when game, earlier it was about okay, one person is playing a game, then it evolved into okay, can I play a multiplayer game with somebody else, I don't want to play against a bot. Then it evolved into can, my, can I play with friends, not just anybody. And now it's gone to an extent where people are like, okay, even if others are playing, I'm going to watch it. And that's what's happening with the creator economy, the influencers. If at all, what YouTube has shown is that, you know, anybody can be a celebrity and it has actually democratized the entire celebrity status, which earlier used to be with the, the movie and the music industry. And I think uh, the way gaming is going to penetrate in different aspects of our lives is going to be phenomenal. Like I'm not able to imagine that, uh, you know, a youth not having a touch point with gaming. I mean, you go on YouTube, there is gaming content, you're talking to your friends, you're talking about games, you're on your mobile, you have games. So the touch points are just immense and I just, I, I, I can sense it that it's only growing and will grow further. So uh, despite, uh, you know, the gaming is, evo is evolving to be a mainstream entertainment, it still has its challenges. So want to know from my panelists, you know, uh, they can talk about it, the challenges of the gaming industry. Samir, uh, you have anything to say on that? I mean, I think the large challenge with India has always been the ability for monetization. Currently, the estimated is 150 million people who are paying out of a base of about 450 million, but the wallet share in terms of our pool is lower. I think the other large challenge has been that I think in the early days of sort of finding ways that people can uh, look at Minfo and Hartpo titles or AA and AAA titles uh, which are currently it's been uh, the market's been kind of trained on playing casual and hyper casual but when it comes to a percentage of time spent uh, and the kind of engagement and sort of fan building and socializing that happens in uh, as the games mature that audience continues to, you know, while it's growing and, you know, arguably BGMI and Free Fire are at that space, but one assumes that it's around 100 million DAO as a total addressable base, right? So there's still substantial amount of growth, especially in advanced markets. If you look at monetization, they tend to come from games that are deeply immersive, say from genres like uh, role playing games like RPG or RDSs beyond just FPSs. So I think that sort of palette is developing within the Indian gaming ecosystem while and it's been dominated by in terms of monetization by RMG. So those are the two pieces I think are not really challenges, it's just a matter of time as this market continues to evolve. I think uh, talent has always been a big problem and uh, as I mentioned earlier, at least uh, it's picking up now. But when it comes to gaming, it's like at the cusp of technology, art, science, data, there's so much that goes into building a game. I can get somebody to pay for a bottle of water, but can I get somebody to pay for consuming a bottle of water virtually? 
and that's the challenge in gaming. People spend thousands of dollars on consuming content which is virtual, which has no real life significance and yet they do that. So to get to that point is where the entire art and craft of making games lie in. And for that, the best of the minds in the country, the youth, people need to know that, you know, this is very, very challenging. And I think for a long while, the concept about, you know, Indians are not going to spend or Indians are not monetizing. So the entire focus was on the consumer, but the focus should be on the content. Titles like PUBG, Clash of Clans now have shown that Indians are spending $100 million and it's not that the GDP of the country increased so much that people thought, okay, I have more money to spend. The money was always there in the wallet, but it was a content problem and I still believe that, you know, a lot of great games, mid-core games, which can be the PUBGs of India, that need to come out in front. Globally, people need to see a success from India that makes its mark, not just in India, but world over. Adding to that, uh, that kind of complements the fact that a lot of dollars till now have been flowing outside India, right? And the economy grows, the industry flourishes if the dollars are circulated inside, right? Like for example, in uh, the analogy of advertisement, a lot of money still flows outside. But as the money started flowing to the creator economy, it started booming up. Another example is real money gaming. Real money gaming is a beautiful product of India, if you ask me. Outside there's no RMG, there's gambling, there's skill based gaming and blah blah blah, right? So RMG gave uh, an interesting avenue that the dollars kept on circulating inside the industry, Indian market itself. That uplifted the market at, at, uh, implicitly, right? So what, you know, uh, Kiti is also trying to say is the more content comes out of India, the more interesting titles, games, or platforms where the money is still flowing in, inside the country, that challenge is something which everybody is addressing now for the good, right? That, that is important because if the money keeps flowing out, the studios outside keep make money, making money and it's too difficult for us to, and everybody comes and says that, hey, you know, there's not enough uh, scope in the industry, uh, they, like, but although the users are ready to pay, Right? But another, there's a chicken and egg there because the talent is still not, it's very subpar here. Like we still want to get the good artists from outside India to, you know, work on the games we are building. I think it has to be solved from the fundamental level that in colleges, in academies, some vocational courses around it. And I see some of the guys have started up on that. And I also personally do some pro bono on that. Like I think when I see some good content, I give my creators to promote for free. Like whoever is associated with Stan, we've got like 5,000 creators working with us. So some of the Indian titles which are really, really working hard to become the next PUBG, uh, we really feel that that should come out very fast. So when it comes to challenges of uh, gaming in India, one basic that we see, the gaming has grown, that is established over here. With the growth of gaming, the perspective uh, and the policies attached to gaming is still not really significantly changed. And uh, the policies are not really stringent or, uh, you know, uniform enough across the states where it, wherein gaming uh, developers as well as the publishers and esports organizers see that there is ban in few states because of the policies and government uh, uh, rules and uh, <clears throat> few other states is uh, it, it, it is again uh, the taxation there is uh, not that uniformity and clarity among uh, the industry as well as this so policy is something that I can say is uh, one challenge that most of the ecosystem is facing from the developers to esports organizers to the media folks as well and apart from that uh, what I have observed in, in my experiences in the rural areas, almost 56% of gamers are in the rural segment right now. And uh, they do not have high-end devices to be paid to play titles. You might get the best of best talent, best of best you know, content and everything else. So what exactly can be the solution? Of course, internet penetration was one, I think, which is getting solved right now, for which they all started playing the games. But there are still lags is what they say and they don't have high-end gadgets to play 
and they don't have consoles and PC so they stick to mobile phones and so how do we really solve this problem and ensure they actually enjoy all the two play titles is something cloud gaming is that uh, what we actually came up with and launched to ensure that one AAA title can be played across all the devices. It could be a console, PC, or mobile, as well as web browsers. So this kind of barriers and blockers are still existing, which are getting resolved one by one, is what I can say. On the flip side, I think it brings out opportunities, right? Like what she mentioned, that cloud gaming came out to be interesting because we want to serve those who don't have good devices. Right. Even in the policy space, I think people find it up, found, found out a way to build something called RMG and got those uh, legal licenses and everything. And then this elephant in the room, which is like a 28% GHT headwind pain. And then, but yeah, we need uh, good, you know, like backers, supporters in the government, uh, you know, forum to kind of still believe that gaming is, you know, the big thing and it's going to contribute a large chunk to the GDP if it works completely in the direction which all of us are choosing. Yeah, but to add to this, I think uh, RMG and eSports should be, should have a clear bifurcation. Uh, there is, uh, there's a lot of mix in the way uh, RMG is perceived versus what exactly eSports is. That's, eSports is purely based on passion and those right. athletes really practice a lot, almost 8 to 10 hours a day. They, they're on their PCs playing. So I think that clear bifurcation as well is very important for these gamers to reach the Olympics level what we really envision uh, for our country to reach. In the so with the challenges around and the opportunity you talked about, how does the future of gaming looks to all of you? Sameer, uh, we start with you. The future of the gaming industry. I mean, in terms of, I, I believe you'll be uh, obviously right, uh, there is a growing as the country's GDP per capita grows. I disagree with some of the statements which are made around Indians have always been spending money. You know, one dominant game from the charts in India and the overall spending does drop. So, and it's not like other games haven't been around here locally for a while to speak. It's, it's also a matter of, you know, getting these. Uh, Certain games like which, say for example, on the PC, Counter Strike has been so dominant in for 15 20 years. So it takes a lot for a game to reach the threshold, and then there is an affinity to actually playing that over the years. So very few games manage to crack into that because this is a hit driven business. Uh, over the next couple of years, I believe that Indian studios will come of age. There are a lot more developers and designers here. Most designers came out of the uh, Indian shops that were set up by global majors, which include the likes of Zinda, Electronic Arts and others. Uh, those folks have now hence used the same playbook that they were accustomed to, which was building hyper-casual and casual and ended up doing a mobile and tasting success. I believe that that mid-core, hard-core segment is very well done, eventually having a lot more experience in building sort of these titles, which we, which you know can last for sometimes more than a decade. Um, and that kind of that kind of attempt is being made now by game developers. The capital is there as well in order to support these kind of studios. Uh, new parts of the ecosystem, such as publishers, are also emerging that reduce the risk, including finding ways to fill the gaps of marketing and going to market. So it's going to be a great time. At the same point of time, I also feel think that uh, while currently mobile is a dominant platform, what we are seeing globally is that cross platform tends to be the place where the new age of games dominates. So it's not just them being on mobile, it also needs to be there on PC and console because in spite of mobile being so large, uh, the volumes of monetization are there, but the scope of what of our pool is much higher in some of those platforms. So I think the skill sets which should have to be developed will continue to move in the direction of more immersion and more quantity and not just remain in the hyper casual and casual space where it's becoming harder and harder to get discovery uh, as you know these platforms are already so mature now uh, and have been there for decades. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys want to say something? The future of gaming? How do you think? I'm very excited and I'm sure everybody else is. That's why a lot of uh, startup founders have you know put things on the line just to 
uh, very big on the gaming uh, industry in India and I expect it to be among the top 10 industries going forward. 10 years back, India was just a download market. The data reports from App Annie and all the gaming platforms used to say, oh, India is number one uh, in downloads and you know it has surpassed uh, all other countries. But it's far away in terms of generating revenue. Now we are in the top 10 globally in generating revenue. And I'm quite sure the spot to number one or number two is not that far. And that keeps all of us very excited. Uh, future of gaming, I think, uh, has different perspective to it. And uh, to start with, I think we all have already entered into Web3 and Metaverse, which has uh, huge monetization opportunities as well. And <clears throat> I recently came across this uh, uh, ad, ad network on a Web3, wherein a game is developed on a common platform and the ad flows through the entire uh, segment of that platform. So, um, Metaverse is something which is a very big future for gaming and cloud gaming is, as I mentioned, uh, it is device agnostic so everybody can adapt to gaming very quickly and experience uh, AAA titles as well. And gamification is picking up a lot these days uh, on the different segment, especially for learning. It could be, it has started already in schools and colleges where they are adapting skill-based uh, games for learning mathematics, logic and different competitive exams as well. So there are multiple uh, you know, uh, use cases which are you know, adapted uh, across the industry and not just uh, in the gaming. So I think AR, VR, uh, cloud gaming, metaverse, web3 as well as uh, your gamification is the, is the future of gaming that we can see where gaming is applied to you know, grow different uh, products as well. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm bullish about the creator economy angle to it. Um, uh, I think distribution is solved because of this specific vertical and distribution will lead to all the ARPUs and revenues and, you know, India becoming the biggest market in the world. So, uh, like, I can tell you an interesting fact that so we at Stan, we did something called the Stan Fan Fest like two years before in Hyderabad, right? And we brought like 100 top gaming creators in one place. 20,000 people turned up there to meet them and, you know, enjoy the experiences. This year we have close to 3,000 applications for creators to be part of Stan Fan Fest. So that in itself is an example that a lot of creators want to, you know, create content on gaming. And these could be like streamers, game, you know, game developers who basically want to showcase something which is attached to gaming, right? And they are looking at places where they can build their communities. So if at all this creator economy in gaming can be cracked well, I think we can really see some really big differences there, right? And, and like Samir mentioned around cross-platform, that is something which we all really enjoy. Like I was at my uh, cousin's place last weekend and I, I saw my nephew playing with another nephew of mine in Ghaziabad and he was on the PS and he was on the PC, right? Both of them playing the same game inside the same lobby. So that is actually a problem solver, right? Whatever device you have, you just into the game and play. And uh, yeah, I think these are certain technological advancements and operational advancements which could really solve the gaps which exist today. We would like some questions from the audience if anybody has. Please give mic to the person. Yeah. yeah, I actually wanted to ask can you talk about the mental health and mental growth of gaming on uh, users? And I've always enjoyed hey, gaming. Even I, right? even I do gaming. And your reflexes improve. There's a lot of, uh, you know, benefits around gaming. I see today parents really want to, you know, make sure their uh, children are aware of what is the latest. Like I, I noticed that somebody was talking about Roblox in a wedding, right? So education is happening through gaming. So mental health is something which obviously comes at you know, in the forefront that 
uh, we should not see you know it getting affected if somebody is playing gaming, right? Uh, it has always been a stigma, but it has changed over a period of time. Obviously, there are measures to control toxicity, which sometimes happen. But I think that is inevitable human thing. If we are conversing, if we are in a playground playing football, also there were people who used to you know be toxic. There were people who were very into sportsmanship, right? I think the same behavior is being replicated in the game, so there is no difference there. Uh, we haven't come across a case yeah. where it's affecting the mental health. It's actually helping people grow their uh, you know IQ and EQ by playing games. That's what our learning is happening. Like if we check the like some like some of the really big gamers, say Ninja or uh, PewDiePie, like all of them have taken break from gaming once in their lifetime because of mental health related issues. And if you say like some current issues, like we might say like Azure Speed is a gamer, and we can see what behavior he does. So that's something I think he's playing around with his content. I met him in person when he was in India. So he's kind of trying each and everything what works for him, and the sad part is this is what worked for him. Right? You you are just associating it to a gaming thing. I believe these people look at producing content. On live streams and platforms which touch the masses, right? Obviously, we can associate Karim Anati as gaming, but he does other content as well on YouTube, right? So it's not something which is affecting too much of mental health. But obviously, like you mentioned, PewDiePie and these guys, we see Jonathan Scout model like these likes of these gamers in India as well, who have represented India outside, and they are doing pretty good. They have turned into content creators. They are becoming coaches in esports, right? And they are. Gamers, right? These are new Indian gamers. Like they are just now emerged. Five years, I have seen portal play. So, let so. me just add to this. So the significant study has told the gray matter in the brain increases uh, even in adults when they involve in gaming. So if I look at the scientific way of it, it does develop in a significant way. The gray matter really helps in the efficiency of the uh, you know you using your brain or logic or rationale. So in a way, it does help the development of the brain and reflexes and different uh, efficiency as well. But anything done in extreme has an impact. Not just gaming, but anything you binge watch overnight that also has impact on your health and mental health. So you cannot really significantly. There is no uh, enough evidences to actually prove that it will affect the mental health. I don't completely deny it. But I don't completely accept it as well because anything, for that matter, done in extreme will result into some mental health uh, issues. So that is to sum up the whole debate. Okay. 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 So just one more question and then we'll wrap it up. I'll make it interesting here. So uh, I think this is a good discussion, uh, especially uh, on the uh, in, uh, Indian gaming spectrum. Uh, would would like to understand your views on uh, how would the how the VR gaming will develop over the years. Now that we are seeing a little bit of adaptation with uh, small little companies like IB Cricket, uh, the the uh, uh, VR cricket, cricket in the game, uh, and now that Apple Vision uh, uh, has got launched in US but not in India, like how do you think uh, the gaming industry, uh, VR gaming industry specifically? Is growing in India, and uh, uh, like uh, would love would, would love to uh, get your insights on that. Uh, anyone in the panel? Sure. So uh, even with Geo, we have something called Geo Glass, which is more or less like a VR experience, and in that gaming is one of the segment. So definitely, the immersive experience is uh, added, and Metaverse is also again merged with the VR experience. So. I think there is a great growth uh, for uh, VR and when it comes to the monetization aspect of it, it has to be still explored a little further. It is not as evolved as the existing gaming market in my opinion. I mean I have tried my hands on MetaQuest 2. I play golf. Uh, I learned golf in the game. So I have not got my hands on the Apple Vision Pro yet but um, I think it is still yet to be solved with the you know shape and form of it. Uh, and India is not uh, ready for very premium product today, right? 
I, I met a couple of founders in some events who are building cool stuff in ARVR, but I think it's going to start with uh, outside market for you know uh, monetization, like you know uh, she's mentioning. Uh, but people love, I think, to to expect experience ARVR. I mean, we've been fans of Ready Player One, right? So we want to wear that and enter the metaverse with my friends sitting in the US. But I think it's something which is in working progress. I don't know. So there's a technology aspect to it and then there is an adoption aspect to it. Adoption is where I think it's been a bit of a challenge and it's been a bit of a challenge for a while now. And anytime you're talking about introducing something new to a user, he has to buy that set, he has to use it, he has to get familiarized and again he can, he has he will not have the same level of social aspect to it that he would have in a mobile game where he's able to play with anybody else. So I think adoption wise, there is a bit of a road ahead for us. Alright, so we end the session here. It was quite insightful. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Samir and I thank all the other panelists. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>